The following interview was conducted with Marshall A. Martin, Senior Associate Director of Agriculture Research Program and Assistant Dean of Agriculture for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Tuesday, March 12, 2013 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, Professor Emerita of uh, Library Science. Good morning, Professor Martin. Thank Good morning. Thank you so much. Tell us a little about where and when you were born and your siblings in early years. Uh, I was born in uh, Kewanee, Illinois, in Henry County, which is north of Peoria, approximately 50 miles. Grew up on the family farm there, and I have uh, one brother who's now a lawyer in uh, Texas. Okay. Uh, what was grade school like? Very unique. I was half my class for the first two years. I went to a country school. We had one teacher for four grades, and so, uh, as I jokingly say, I was the bottom half of my class. The girl was smarter. Uh, and so I went two years to a country school, and then the schools actually consolidated. I went to the city school called uh, Weathersfield and, and went through high school at that school. Okay. Yeah, moving on to high school. Tell us about high school and your course of study and activities, et cetera. Well, in high school, I was actually involved in uh, the Future Farmers of America, now called FFA, and had number, a number of offices both at the local chapter and as well as at the state level and received the Illinois State Farmer degree, which is the highest award you can get from FFA in the state. I played for three of my four years in high school in the uh, state FFA band in Chicago and Springfield and in Champaign-Urbana. I was actively involved in the in the the band, concert band, marching band. I was even the uh, the assistant conductor of the high school band. Uh, I was also quite active in uh, musicals and, and school plays. Uh, so those are my major activities. I was not involved in athletics in high school. Uh, being a farm boy, there was a lot of chores to do before and after school. So we lived a distance from the from the school. So I was not involved in athletics, but heavily involved in music and FFA were my primary activities. And I was the um, the uh, co. Uh, uh, chair of the high school yearbook, and that looked, took a lot of time in my senior year. I would think so, that's right. And college, you went to, you got your degree from Iowa State. How did you happen to select that? And tell us about college. Well, I, I did get my uh, first degree, my Bachelor of Science degree from Iowa State University. Uh, probably one, because it's, it's a very fine university. It uh, was well recognized then and still is today. Uh, and we had uh, a high school classmate who had gone there and I went with him to visit the campus and really fell in love with the campus and it had the areas I was interested in in agricultural engineering, agricultural economics. So I have a major in agricultural economics and agricultural business and a minor in agricultural engineering from Iowa State University. Okay, what was campus like? Did you live on campus? And we did. I lived in the in the residence hall my entire time there. I was not active in any uh, sure. uh, uh, Greek uh, fraternity. Okay. Uh, and then um, you went on for graduate work? For well, or no, or not immediately. What immediate. happened I, I, after commencement? No, uh, I was very active in the Wesley Foundation at Iowa State University, and that's where I met my wife. She was uh, a student at the time in what they then called home economics, and uh, we both had interest in international service. So my wife and I were selected as the first married couple ever in the history of the Methodist Church uh, to go overseas. Uh, with my background in agriculture and her background in home economics and particularly nutrition, uh, we went through a, s a significant screening process of medical exams, psychiatric exams, psychological exams, theological exams at a seminary and were selected uh, by the New York World Office of the Methodist Church. And so then uh, uh, after we graduated from high school, as uh, I came home and helped my father finish planting corn, uh, we got married and left immediately for New York uh, for training and then uh, to Costa Rica for a language school for about four months and then on to the country of Bolivia uh, where we served for about four years. I taught vocational agriculture. I taught in a seminary. Uh, I worked with Heifer Project International and I was appointed by the bishop as the director of the school. The school had 400 students uh, during the day, we had three uh, shifts a day. We had a morning for high school, an afternoon for the elementary, and an evening for adult education. Wow. We had a 25-acre farm for uh, teaching purposes uh, for our students. We ran a residence hall with about 125 boys and about 25 uh, girls in a separate residence hall. My wife and I served as the, uh, uh, the, the dorm parents, so to speak, for the girls' residence hall. Uh, I did a lot of work in rural areas in, in, in the country of Bolivia. So then we came uh, to Purdue for the first time and did our, my graduate work here, both master's and PhD. Okay, that was a good interim. That was a busy time for you, good, good context. Um, career path be prior to coming to Purdue? 
Well, as I just said, we were with, we were with South and America. You to, and you stayed on after you got your degree? Yes, okay. we, I came to, to Purdue for graduate work, and, and I did not think I would remain on the faculty here. In fact, in the 1950s and 1960s, so I was told, many of the, the faculty hires in the Department of Agriculture Economics at Purdue, where I received my graduate degrees, had been Purdue graduates. And there was a concern by many of the more senior faculty that they were hiring too many of their own graduates. And so since I was a Purdue uh, master's and PhD, I didn't think I even had an opportunity here. So I frankly had been interviewing at, at Michigan State and University of Florida and Iowa State and other places and had a job offer. Uh, from Michigan State University to join their faculty uh, when Dr. Paul Ferris, who just passed away here recently, uh, called me and said, had I signed the letter to go to Michigan State? And I said, no, it's on my desk. It's a nice offer. I probably will take this offer. And he said, could you wait a week? I said, why? I said, well, Dr. Don Parlberg uh, has just uh, uh, announced that he's leaving Washington, D.C., where he was Assistant Secretary of Agriculture and had been the faculty member teaching agricultural policy at Purdue. He's going to retire. He's going to come back to West Lafayette and write some books. We have a vacancy. We'd like to interview you. And so because of Dr. Don Perlberg's retirement after being the Assistant Secretary of Agriculture uh, for eight years in the Nixon and Ford administrations, there was an opportunity at Purdue. I interviewed. They made me an offer that was just perfect for me. I could do teaching, research, extension, graduate work, undergraduate uh, teaching, and, can, and then later, as we'll talk about, went into uh, various uh, levels of administration. Right. And, okay. So then your initial point was teaching, and you've got quite a few outstanding teaching awards. Tell us a little bit about your research focus. My uh, first yeah. research focus initially was in the area of agricultural and trade policy. Mm -hmm. But like most new assistant professors, I was looking for my niche. What, what would be my unique contribution? And we had several outstanding faculty here at the time working in that area. Dr. Robert Parlberg, uh, uh, sorry, Dr. Robert Thompson, uh, who went on to be an assistant secretary of agriculture, director of the rural development of the World Bank. Uh, and so I didn't really want to compete with him. He was a couple years my senior. We had uh, Dr. Ed Shue, who had been my mentor for my PhD, and so he was uh, a world-renowned scientist. So I thought, what's my niche? Because I've got some pretty strong people in the department. So I moved into the area of technology assessment and technology policy early in my career, focusing initially on pesticide issues, and then was one of the first agriculture economists in the United States to work on the uh, economic uh, and business aspects of biotechnology uh, in the early to mid-1980s. Wow. Yeah, okay. And then um, you also taught uh, Ag uh, 410. So the, the teaching impact of technology in the classroom has made a big, big difference, hasn't it, when you, compared to when you first started? Yeah, I taught uh, uh, two undergraduate classes most of my career in the department. I taught a course in agricultural policy at the senior level for about 25 years. And in the early years, uh, that, that was more of the traditional lecture. And then I began to bring more guest lectures. I actually sat in the studios right here and did videotaping and, and also around the state with uh, uh, world-recognized policy leaders. And, and so brought, brought computer into the classroom, uh, was one of the first people to use the, the, the Internet uh, to have uh, lessons online and uh, wrote interactive uh, lectures that were uh, graphical explanations of policy. So, yes, I did try to bring technology into the classroom uh, in the policy area. I also taught for 17 years a senior class in econometrics and price analysis. And there again, I can remember carrying what they called a portable computer, I think it weighed about 20 pounds, over to University Hall from the Cranert Building and hooked it up to a overhead projector with a, a special attachment so I could project onto the screen the actual typing on the computer to show them how to do statistics. And so that was long before even the uh, the PC was really available. Uh, so yes, I have tried to use uh, technology in, in my undergraduate as well as graduate teaching. Well, it's sort of nice to to go in retrospect and see you know what you and it, it worked. But now you know you you move on uh, as the, as the uh, technology assessment goes on too. Well, that's right. When I first taught, I we were using you know the old IBM cards. And then we went to the the so-called uh, kind of an online system, and then eventually to the personal computers. <laughs> right. I hear you. Um, now, Department of Agricultural Economics, you chaired the graduate committee for a while. And tell us about when you were associate head of the department. Yeah. 
Yeah, I went on a sabbatical in the early 1980s to the University of Chicago in the economics department. I knew personally the provost at the University of Chicago. I had a wonderful time going to lunch with Nobel laureates in economics. They have more Nobel laureates in economics at the University of Chicago than any place else in the world. So it was a wonderful a sabbatical. When I came back, uh, I chaired for a while our, our PhD prelim program, and then shortly after that was asked to be the chair of the graduate admissions committee and did that for about uh, six or seven years, and we grew the program from about uh, 75 to over 100 uh, graduate students in the Department of Agriculture and Economics. So I did a lot of recruiting. In fact, my department had came to me and he said, I want you to go visit with uh, Coach Gene Cady. And I didn't quite understand why, but his point was, just like in basketball, you need to recruit the best talent. We wanted to recruit the best talent for our graduate <laughs> program. And then I became the associate department head uh, for another six or seven years. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in that role, well, there were two of us. There was the department head, and then myself as the associate head, who were the only two senior administrators in the department. We had over 40 faculty, over 400 uh, undergrad students, and over 100 undergraduate students at the time, uh, with a lot of teaching, research, and extension activities. And I coordinated the extension programs, uh, had a lot of the travel issues, and then just stepped into the department head when he was traveling. He also did a lot of international work. So there were several months out of the year when I'd be the acting department head. Okay, sounds good. Now let's move into the Agriculture Research Program, where you're a senior associate director. Tell the research a little bit about the responsibilities and challenges. Well, when Dr. Randy Woodson was the director of agriculture research at Purdue, he, he came to me and asked if I'd be willing to join him in the role of, at that time, the associate director, uh, because the person who'd been in that role was retiring from Purdue. I agreed to do that. I worked with Dr. Woodson then for several years until he became our dean of agriculture and then provost. He's now the chancellor at North Carolina State University. So I had the chance to work with a very outstanding uh, academic leader, both at Purdue and now at North Carolina State. Uh, he was then replaced by Dr. Sonny Ramaswamy, uh, who came here as the director of research uh, for about three years or so. He's now the uh, senior director for the National Institutes of Food and Agriculture for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, another great leader. And in the interim between Purdue and, and Washington, D.C., he was the dean of agriculture at Oregon State. I currently work with Dr. Karen Plout. Uh, she uh, came to us uh, from Michigan State, where she was head of the Animal Science Department. She's an outstanding scientist. She's also worked with NASA in the shuttle space program, and she worked uh, with the National Institutes of Health uh, with breast cancer research uh, before joining us. So she's been wonderful to work with. So I've worked with three uh, directors of agricultural research and associate mm -hmm. deans, and when and I've worked now under three deans, uh, uh, Dean Woodson, and as well as Dean Vic Lechtenberg, and now uh, Dean Jay Ackridge. And so uh, I've enjoyed working with these people in a variety of leadership roles uh, as the senior associate director of research sure. and assistant dean. Okay. And, and are you still serving as assistant dean of agriculture? Do you still have yes. that? Yes. And what, oh, anything specific about uh, that particular role? Well, my, my work currently falls into three or four areas. One of those, there is a considerable amount of um, federal reporting. Uh, our faculty in the College of Agriculture, Veterinary Medicine, and in some departments and what's now Health and Human Sciences receive what we call Hatch funding or federal formula mm -hmm. funds that goes clear back to the Hatch Act of 1887, right. which is one of the pillars of the land grant system. And so it's a, it's a cost share. Some of the money comes from the federal government and some from state government. Every faculty who's funded by that money has to have a five-year research plan. Uh, I uh, serve as the chair of those review panels and handle the paperwork for all those projects. Uh, and then there's an annual report all faculty have to submit. There's about 350 of those I manage annually that goes into a special database, USDA, for part of our accountability. So that's one part of this is working with faculty throughout those three colleges to help them guide their research planning and their research reporting and accountability. A second area, and this is more of in the assistant dean uh, area perhaps, I work with a number of the commodity organizations as the liaison between Purdue University and these groups. So for example, I'm the uh, uh, member of the Board of Directors uh, of the Indiana Corn Marketing Council, uh, Board of Directors of Indiana Soybean Alliance. Those are both checkoff organizations that in part provide some research funding to Purdue faculty, and I work with those faculty to help them write their proposals and, and track their, their, their reporting and their research activities. I serve as the uh, member of the Indiana Pork Board and the secretary of the Pork Board. I've done that for about nine years mm -hmm. now. I also uh, am a, uh, the uh, secretary of the Agricultural Alumni Seed Improvement Association. It was established in 1938 to help in the transfer of seed and seed technology from the university to the seed industry and to the farmers of Indiana and beyond. Uh, they are one of the three largest uh, popcorn seed developers now in the world, and I work very closely with that organization. 
I serve on the board of directors of the Indiana Crop Improvement Association, which is seed certification. So all companies that produce seed in the state of Indiana have to have it certified by a third party to certify for its quality and its, its, uh, its attributes. Uh, I also serve as the director of the Indiana Wine Grape Council. Every time someone buys uh, wine in the state of Indiana, no matter where it's from, whether it's from Napa Valley or Malbec from Argentina or a Bordeaux from France or an Indiana wine, there's a five cent per gallon tax that was established by the Indiana General Assembly in 1989. That provides some funding for Purdue to help support in part our work in enology, that's winemaking, our work in viticulture, the production of grapes, and I work with the faculty and staff uh, to help support uh, the wine grape industry in the state of Indiana. We now have about 70 wineries in the state and about 600 acres of grapes being produced in the state of Indiana. So it's a, it's a growing industry with a lot of agritourism and a lot of uh, cultural and community kinds of things related to that. So mm -hmm. those are the areas uh, that I work with the stakeholders of the state. Of course, I also work with the Indiana State Department of Agriculture. The first and second directors are both former students of mine. Work with the Farm Bureau. The, the president of Farm Bureau is a personal friend of mine. Uh, I serve as the um, uh, executive secretary of the Farm Policy Study Group. That means twice a year to study national and global policy issues, not just farm, but uh, might be Social Security or uh, federal uh, uh, tax issues or biotechnology issues uh, or school educational issues. And it has members uh, on it from the Board of Trustees of Purdue, uh, leaders in the state of Indiana, and so I work with them and, and organize their program. So work in a variety of ways in terms of outreach to, to the state. Right, okay. Mm -hmm. Now we'll talk a little bit about some of the ac other activities. The North Central Agriculture Experiment Station Research Administrator Association, he was a chair several mm -hmm. years ago. The, the United States, for purposes of administering our research activities in agriculture, is divided into four regions. And Purdue University is located in the North Central region, and that includes about 12 universities from the Northwest would be uh, North Dakota State up in Fargo, and to the extreme east would be Ohio State over in Ohio and all the others in between. And so uh, I have served for a number of years uh, as one of the Purdue representatives on that uh, committee. And for a period of time, I was the chair-elect chair and then past chair of the directors of research for the North Central Region. I also served as uh, a member and then chair of what's called the Multi-State Research Committee. We have over 400 um, research committees throughout the United States that faculty can participate in to help coordinate across state lines uh, our research to do it in a more synergistic way. And so I've, I served as, uh, as the chair of that oversight committee. I also was appointed to serve nationally on the National Research Support Program Committee. There's a, about 1% of the federal funds for land-grant universities is what we call off-the-top funds. They set those aside to help support the, the national research system and things that, that are very important for the support, such as in the area of um, bioinformatics for uh, the, the animal uh, genomics work, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So I've served in several roles at the uh, regional level and some of those led in some national involvement as well. All right, now I'll talk about some work with your several state and national, you mentioned some of that, but you might want to highlight some of the. Well, I, I've mentioned the ones I work in right. the commodity groups at the state level, I've mentioned what I've done at the North Central level. Right. I've also served on some other national committees uh, related to USDA. Uh, such as the 2008 Farm Bill called for oversight of our plan of work uh, for the land-grant system nationally, and I was one of 12 that spent, spent some time in Washington, D.C. Uh, working on, on that. I also serve as the administrative advisor for several of these multi-state research committee meetings, uh, the two most active ones. One is in the area of most economists measuring the impacts of investment in agricultural research on society. What's the payback to society for investing? And it's, it's quite high. It's 50 to 75 percent annual rates of return of these investments in ag research. And quite frankly, we are under investing in the agricultural research. And when I say agriculture, I don't mean just farms. We're talking mm -hmm. about food and nutrition and climate change and environmental impacts of agriculture, uh, as well as the production of agriculture, the food processing, the food distribution, and the entire value chain, which now includes biofuels and other areas. Mm -hmm. In fact, if you think about the grand challenges facing our society globally today, they're mostly related to, to our natural resource agricultural system. Climate change, right. biofuels, uh, food security, uh, food safety and food nutrition, obesity, Many of these major questions are ones that uh, we have faculty engaged in in some way, and so we have these national committees that work on that. So one's on the 
on the investment side and the impacts of that. The second one I work with is in the area of uh, farm and rural safety, and that's a group of people from across the country that look at not just um, you know farm machinery on the highways, that's an important safety yeah. issue, but I'm also sure. working conditions for uh, uh, people that are employed in agriculture or in, in the grain handling uh, areas so we avoid grain bin accidents or other kinds of things, and including training the, uh, the EMTs and the people who are the first responders. So when there is an accident in a rural area, a rural community, uh, they're well trained how to respond to things other than just a, a house fire. That's right, good, okay. Um, when you were at the uh, USDA, the Agricultural Biotechnology Advisory Committee, that uh, the Secretary of Agriculture at that time, Dan, Dan Glickman, appointed you. Just make a comment on that. Yeah, I was uh, when Dan Glickman was Secretary of Agriculture mm -hmm. in the uh, second administration of uh, uh, President uh, Clinton, uh, I was pleased to be one of about uh, roughly 25 or 30 members of a national advisory committee on biotechnology, and we faced some serious challenges uh, about technology and, and uh, public acceptance and uh, the regulatory oversight, and so I made numerous trips to Washington, D.C. Uh, to work with that uh, a group of scientists and other public uh, servants to provide some advice to the secretary, and I met him several times when I was in D.C. Yeah, okay. Um, is, are you still involved with the uh, MS MBA, that distant education program uh, with Purdue and IU? Yes, I am. Oh, okay. Yes, I am. Uh, there are two ways that I'm involved in that program. Uh, the, uh, a couple of words of background first. So uh, about uh, almost a decade ago, uh, when Dr. Jackridge was the director of our Center for Food and Agriculture Business before he became our Dean of Agriculture, uh, we established an MS MBA program by distance education. Uh, we have the, the only one in the world that focuses on agribusiness that is a distance-based program. There are many other distance-based MBA programs, but they're more traditional and not specific to oh, the agricultural sector. Uh, we have an agreement with the Kelly School of Business at Indiana University in Bloomington. They teach about no, 55 or 60 percent of the credit hours in the more core areas of business, such as uh, finance and accounting and legal issues and human resources and those kinds of things. Uh, and they offer the MBA degree. The MS degree comes from the Department of Agriculture Economics at Purdue, and that's more in the area of agricultural policy, uh, strategy, um, and management issues related to the agricultural sector. Uh, in that program, I do two things. I teach the capstone research course every summer. It's a 12-week uh, course uh, where they do two things. The students learn, one, uh, how to write a research uh, plan, which they then, then have to execute and actually do a, a thesis-like experience uh, with an advisor. And secondly, the course uses Harvard Business School, primarily uh, case studies to help them learn about how to make decisions in the agribusiness world. The other part is they have an international residency, and currently we do that in Argentina, and I travel with them along with the current director of the program, Dr. Alan Gray, who was just in the news this week with receiving a, a named professorship from Land O'Lakes. Uh, I was in the John Courier, in fact, yesterday. Uh, and so I travel with him, and the students then have an intensive strategy experience as we visit agribusiness firms throughout the country of Argentina, uh, I helped uh, develop uh, an agreement with uh, Austral University, which also has an MBA program in agribusiness in Argentina, so it's a cooperative or partnership relationship with a major university in Argentina. Oh, that's good. Now, that, talk a little bit about South America. You spent quite a bit of time there. We mentioned that earlier. So. I did. Besides the, the uh, time in Costa Rica and language school and Bolivia that I've mentioned, right. I then did my doctor dissertation field research in the country of Brazil and was a visiting uh, researcher at the Luis de Queiroz University in the town of Piracicaba in the state of Sao Paulo, uh, about a two hour drive from the city of Sao Paulo. And uh, half my time there was collecting data and doing work on my doctoral dissertation, which was looking at the impacts of technological change on Brazilian agriculture. The second part of my time there was working with their graduate students. They had established a very new master of science program in agricultural economics and rural sociology. So I mentored about half or more of their master's students and helped them to develop their research program. Uh, so my first foreign language in high school was French. My second foreign language was Spanish and my third foreign language was Portuguese. I don't use the French very much now because I just don't have contacts with that part of the world, but I use Spanish every day. I receive emails every day from out of Latin America uh, and use Portuguese uh, from time to time. 
Uh, besides travel into South America on a regular basis, I was there four times last year in Brazil, in Colombia, and then twice in Argentina in 2012, and I'll be going to Argentina with students in May of 2013. I also have many delegations that come here partly because I'm here, so I have a group uh, coming in a week or two from Brazil, uh, working with a major company called Syngenta that I'll speak to in Portuguese over here in the Memorial Union. I have several groups that come from Argentina, generally in August, uh, they're en route to the Farm Progress Show uh, over in Iowa. So I have a number of delegations that will come through here as well that I work with. As a result of that, that's very nice. Um, let's see, uh, talk about your family. I'm married. Uh, my wife uh, has a, uh, who I met at Iowa State University, also came from a rural background in Illinois. Uh, she has uh, her BS degree from Iowa State and her master's degree and PhD from Purdue University. She is trained in nutrition science her area of research is osteoporosis and women's health primarily. She is the director of Camp Calcium for Purdue University with Dr. Connie Weaver, who is the, uh, the head of the Department of Nutrition Science. She's published extensively in the area of osteoporosis and, and bone health. Uh, she's done research in the rat lab. She's done re clinical research with uh, adolescents. She's done clinical research with uh, postmenopausal women. And last year, an exciting project, she actually worked with the Osava pig and did a swine study uh, using 24 uh, female gilt uh, pigs that were, uh, were actually housed in the uh, College of Veterinary Medicine here on campus. So it was a collaborative work with the uh, School of uh, Medicine at Indiana University, uh, used the facilities in the College of Veterinary Medicine at Purdue. Uh, we used, she used students uh, from the Department of Animal Science and the College of Agriculture. She had faculty from the College of Science and the Physics Department because they used radioactive tracers, and of course the, the, Depart uh, the College of Health and Human Sciences. So a true, true collaborative research, multiple departments, multiple universities, multiple colleges, to look at the issue of calcium supplements that many older women are taking and whether that has or not any adverse impact on their cardiovascular system and they use this special uh, hog as their model. So she's very active in research and, and, and travel and publication as well. We have two children. I have a daughter who got her first degree in pharmacy from Purdue and then went on to the University of New Mexico for her graduate work and she's now an associate professor uh, of uh, pharmacy at the uh, University of uh, New Mexico in Albuquerque. Uh, her husband uh, has a PhD from Purdue in electrical engineering uh, and he works with Sandia Laboratories there in Albuquerque and they have two, uh, two children, uh, two sons. Uh, one is a fourth grader and one's a first grader uh, this year. I have a son who um, went to University of Evansville and played football for them and got a minor in business as well as a, a major in biology. He came to Purdue for an MBA uh, and he works now with uh, Procter & Gamble in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, he's the North American brand manager for the oral hygiene division of Procter & Gamble, that's the Crest uh, products. <laughs> and uh, he's married and his wife has her degree in um, uh, uh, kindergarten and, and uh, young uh, school education. They have two daughters, so one is a fourth grader and one is about uh, three years old. Uh, so oh, that's my family and they all have, uh, but all my daughter-in-law all have at least one Purdue degree. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> okay, uh, some awards. Um, the couple that I like to, to should admit, the Beck's Hybrid and the Special Boiler America and the Hovde Award. I've been honored uh, uh, and, nice. and humbled many times by various awards. The, the, the three that you mentioned are as follows. The most recent one was the Beck Hybrid Award in 2012. Uh, the um, uh, state of Indiana has all the commodity groups come together for now a, a major forum. They call it the Livestock Forage and Grain Forum. It's held at the JW Marriott in downtown Indianapolis. And they recognize four people each year from the state of Indiana who have made significant contributions to the state. Uh, one of whom is typically somebody at Purdue who's involved in education outreach, and I was the second recipient of that award. The others are in the area of community service, another in the area of, of journalism and, and outreach, uh, educational outreach through journalism, and another one in terms of um, vocational agriculture. The other award you mentioned was the Special Boilermaker Award. Uh, the Purdue Alumni Association annually uh, generally recognize two individuals they may be uh, employees of Purdue, faculty or other employees, they may be uh, other citizens that have contributed significantly to the student life and the student experience uh, at Purdue University. 
Uh, I think the primary reason besides my many years of undergraduate teaching and counseling was the fact that for more than a decade I served as a member of and chair of the uh, the advisory board for the Department of Bands at Purdue University and so worked heavily with the uh, student organization including travel with them to bowl games. I traveled internationally and was a master of ceremony for the Purdue All-American Marching Band in Venezuela in Spanish uh, before immense crowds of thousands of people <laughs> and so it was quite an honor to be uh, recognized at ross State Stadium um, a couple of years ago. Uh, the um, Hubdi Award is uh, in, in, in honor of Dr. Hubdi, uh, Frederick Hubdi who was the, the president of Purdue University for many years uh, that is uh, sponsored by the uh, College of Agriculture, Purdue University, and the Indiana Farm Bureau. And they present that award one person each year uh, at the annual uh, convention of the Indiana Farm Bureau in Indianapolis. And that's for somebody who has significantly impacted in a significant or positive way uh, the rural people uh, of the state of Indiana. Does that, is it limited only to Purdue or, or is it open to anybody in the state? It's okay. only in the College of Agriculture or affiliated with it. Okay, I see, already. Um, the endowed scholarships, you mentioned that you and your wife have, and do you want to make a comment on that? I would, nice. humbly. Right. Um, I'm a first generation college graduate. My father was a, was a tenant farmer, uh, and my, my father grew up in those years of the Great Depression of the 1930s, and so while we, we, we lived comfortably, we were not a wealthy family. And uh, I was fortunate to have a scholarship from a local company that helped in part pay for my college education when I went to Iowa State University. And my wife and I wanted to give back in appreciation to what Purdue has done uh, for us in terms of our education and our careers. And so we've established in recent years uh, three endowed scholarships. There's one in the Department of Agricultural Economics called the, the Marshall Martin Public Policy Award. Right. It goes to a student who has a, a interest in, aspiration to be involved in economic and public policy issues. And I, I don't select the person, but I always have the privilege of, of meeting them or taking them to dinner and getting to know them. Uh, the second one that we established was in the Department of Bands, and it's in, in collaboration with my daughter and son-in-law who met in the Purdue Jazz Band, band and who played in the <laughs> symphonic band together at Purdue when they were students here. And that is to an outstanding student in the jazz program. Uh, I have great love for music. I still play the trumpet. I'll be playing on Easter Sunday again this year, as I do for many years, with some much better musicians than I here in the, in the greater Lafayette area. And uh, so uh, we, we've done that. And again, students who show real promise in music, uh, obviously we don't have a school of music at Purdue, but we have a fine music program with over 800 students in our department of bands and all kinds of ensembles from jazz to symphonic bands to the All-American Marching Band and many others. And so we wanted to, to help students who want to get a Purdue degree and enjoy their music have that opportunity. Nice. And the third one is very new that uh, uh, my wife primarily established with my encouragement in the Department of Nutrition Science, which is her home department, and that will be awarded for the first time in the, this coming year. Uh, to a stu undergraduate student in uh, interest in nutrition science. That's very nice. Uh, professional associations, there's quite a few that you know, make any comment on a particular one. Uh, you've got the International Association of Agricultural Economics. That I've been a member of a number of professional organizations, right, uh -huh. uh, not very active in recent years, but, but sure. a member of the International Association of Agriculture Economists, uh, active uh, for many years in uh, what was once called the, the American Agriculture Economic Association, now called the Agriculture and Applied Economic Association, they changed their name a few years ago, and had some offices and some leadership roles there, you know, chair of the National Committee that uh, uh, reviewed all of the master's thesis of the United States for awards and worked on a number of committees and, and, and various affiliations with that professional organization uh, over the years as well. Uh, community service, the, uh, you're still involved with the Methodist Church of the state and local and I've been involved in a few ways in the community. I was involved uh, heavily in the West Lafayette School Corporation when our children were, right. were there. I was the chair for several years of the uh, parent uh, association for the uh, music program. Uh, for several years I helped build the set for the musicals for the West Lafayette High School. My daughter and son were both involved in musicals. In fact, my son sang the lead in Hello Dolly when he was a junior in high school at West Lafayette. <laughs> and my daughter was in, involved in the pit band and the music program <laughs> there. So uh, school involvement, uh, as I said, uh, I think my son was involved in uh, baseball and basketball and, and football throughout his years. So my wife was heavily involved with some of the athletic support things. And of course, you work with your spouse on that. Uh, we were very much involved in, you know, planning for prom and after prom parties. So lots of community service through the school when our children were in the school. 
I also was on the search committee to find one of the hire one of the school superintendents for West Lafayette School Corporation. Mm -hmm. uh, with the Methodist Church, uh, as I indicated earlier, we began our career in Latin America as essentially Methodist missionaries. Uh, we were heavily involved in the local church here, and in recent years, I was the uh, chair of the building committee and the project manager for the relocation and the construction of a roughly five million dollar uh, new church facility located uh, just north of the West Lafayette city limits, and. Uh, uh, worked with the contractors and the architects and the and the, the congregation uh, to do that. Been a lot of administrative roles in that in that church. Uh, I was um, a lay a preacher throughout the district uh, for many years, and for a short time was the uh, chair of the board of global ministries for the North Indiana Conference uh, Methodist Church involved in mission outreach programs. Uh, but also in a lot of practical ways, you know, I, I help them on, you know, mow the grass and take care of the grounds and do, do other special projects. I also had a lot of uh, fun the last several years uh, teaching an adult class. So we uh, are working our way through uh, through the Bible and some other kinds of things. So I do some <laughs> teaching still in the, in the local church. <laughs> That's nice. Now some local activities, the blueberry and also the uh, the soybean and the farming in, so in Clinton County. Yeah, uh, when well, my wife and I, mostly myself, were involved in two different farming operations. Mm -hmm. About 22 years ago, we bought some property just north of West Lafayette, and I worked with a local physician who started it, and then he uh, he moved on to uh, practice medicine elsewhere, and so I bought the property from him. So we've had uh, this UPIC blueberry farm now called Martin Acres LLC. Uh, we have literally hundreds of people from the greater Lafayette area come every summer uh, for harvesting. Uh, we are open in the evenings from 5.30 to, to 9 each evening, Monday through Friday. And we do it in the evenings in part because my wife and I are both active on campus, but also it's just hot during the day for harvesting. And, and also most people in this community are dual career, they have families, and it's just much more pleasant, convenient for them to come out in the evenings to, to do that. So I do the production work uh, on that as well as handle the sales operation. And then a few years ago, we bought some some uh, corn and soybean production land over in Clinton County, just east of uh, Lafayette, and uh, had that for a number of years. Uh, I had a master's student who was doing her degree with me back in the late 1990s, and I had known her parents for a number of years. And so one day I said to her, I said, if you ever, your dad ever needs help on the farm, let me know, I'll be glad to help out. Well, it's, she said, in fact, we do. So I went out and, and ran a big tractor for him one Saturday, and uh, to, to fast forward some 13 or 14 years later, I now do all of their tillage work in the fall uh, on the several, uh, about 1,500 acres, uh, run the grain cart for them when they're harvesting the combine, occasionally unload their semi-trucks, work ground for them to plant the uh, wheat in the fall. So so I've become a kind of a, a part of their, their operation, and they farm in four counties. So they're farming in White County, Carroll County, Clinton County, and Tippecanoe County. So I've become quite active in the fall in particular, uh, helping out on, on, on not only their farm, but also on the land that uh, my wife and I own in, in Clinton County. Nice. And the hobbies, the collecting of the antique farm. I, I in fact, have started a, another new hobby. I, my my <laughs> roots uh, are very much in agriculture, as obvious from this interview. So um, years ago, I, I did purchase two antique uh, farm oil tractors that are uh, essentially identical to the ones that uh, my father owned that I operated when I was in junior high and high school. Uh, one of them is now be, has been fully restored uh, um, and is now being painted. And the other one is uh, soon to go into the shop for some repairs, and then it'll be painted sometime later this year. I don't have a lot of time to do it. I've hired some people to help me. Some of the work requires taking them apart and doing work on engines or transmissions. Sure. Now, that's not my expertise. Uh, I can do some things, but, but when it comes to tearing an engine down, putting it back together, I don't have the, the expertise mm -hmm. or all the shop equipment. That's kind of dangerous to do unless you have the right equipment. Uh, my intention is to take those to some shows. Uh, one will be probably the Tippecanoe County uh, Steam and Power Show that's in July, which is down at the uh, amphitheater here just north of uh, West Lafayette. And one of my acquaintances is, uh, is uh, Max Armstrong. If anyone knows the um, rural journalism, they know, probably know the name of Orrin Lee Samuelson, who for many years was the voice of agriculture for WGN radio and television. Max Armstrong was his uh, associate. He's a Purdue graduate from Princeton, Indiana, down near Evansville. He and I become friends. I was the translator for WGN television in Argentina for Max Armstrong some years ago. And he's a tractor, uh, collector of antique tractors, so he wants me to take them to a couple of shows over in, in Illinois this summer, one near uh, Morris, Illinois, up uh, suburb of Chicago, and one over um, north of Champaign-Urbana at the old Rantoul uh, Air Force Base. Uh, they, uh, they sort of... Uh, reflect back on the, uh, the original farm progress show some 50 plus years ago. So people bring some of their antique tractors in and have a lot of fun reminiscing about how, uh, how we used to farm. Oh, that sounds good. Um, 
And now, in the final thing about teaching, about between teaching, research, and administration at the department and the college level, in your own words, it's it's a it's a balance. It's uh, what you've been have experienced. You know, I'm a firm believer, uh, and have tried to live uh, the land grant mission spirit. As you know, there there are three important parts to a land grant university. Clearly, the uh, the Morrill Act of 1862 established the teaching function. To, to provide uh, education opportunities for the people of the United States and beyond, uh, and focus initially in agriculture and the mechanic arts, which we now call engineering. Uh, the second was the, the Hatch Act, which established the, the, the agriculture experiment station, the research function. And then in 1914, the Smith-Lever Act that established right. the extension service to reach out to the, the, the people of the state. It used to be rural people, but it's everyone now. Right. Uh, it's, it's not just the rural people. And so those three areas are the strong missionaries of our university and of the land-grant system. And I have had, throughout my entire career, appointments in all three areas of teaching, research, and extension. The other kind of fourth area is the international part. We've talked about that in this interview. And so I've, I've done that. I've continued to do that. I've, I've lived in... in uh, two different countries and I've traveled and worked in about 25 countries. We didn't talk about my work in Egypt or India or Russia or Western Europe it's your, or publication of books in Europe. Uh, and so I've worked extensively in the international area uh, uh, over my career and continue to do that. Uh, and then, then the service leadership area administration at the departmental level and now at the, uh, at the college level. So I really have been blessed uh, with living uh, throughout my career this true land grant um, uh, philosophy. Right. Anything that you'd like to add or that I've neglected uh, to ask in closing? I'll leave it up to you. Well, I the think one we've thing we forgot, I did, I have an error, the high school award. Oh, yes. Uh, about three years ago, uh, my high school uh, began uh, to recognize uh, each year three or four of their graduates who've had successful careers and professions, and I was honored to be. Uh, one of the members of the of the inaugural right. Weathersfield High School Academic uh, Hall of Fame, and so Weathersfield High School is located in uh, Kewanee, Illinois, and Henry County. So I had a chance to go back and and tour the school, and meet the school superintendent, some of the school board members, and 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 was presented with an award, and then uh, shared some remarks with the community while I was back uh, there. And and one of the things that was really f interesting. I was one of those members of the class that left the community and never returned to live there and have very few ties there now because my parents are deceased and so uh, I, I don't have any real close family ties in that community. But I, I called a couple of classmates that I was gonna be back in town and be recognized as an award and I was honored that about a fourth to a third of my high school class and their spouses went to lunch with me uh, on that weekend. And, and and as my wife said, I can't stop being a teacher and professor because I, I said, I wanna go around the table, I'm gonna ask each of you some questions about what have you done, tell me about your life. Tell me some stories. Isn't that nice? And we had a delightful time together that weekend. Not only was I honored with the award, but a chance to, to go back and reconnect with right. classmates and, and, and friends in the community and learn about what what they had done with their lives. That's very good. Any uh, Anything in closing, or do you think we've covered it? I just thing? thank you very much. It's, it's a pleasure to, to, to visit with you today and share a few things about, about my life with, with, with Purdue and this community. So I thank my, you. My pleasure, and I appreciate that very much. Thank you very thank you. much. Thank you.